Happy Tuesday! My name is Phil Osophical and I am extremely excited to be alive in these amazing times. It is October 4th, 2011 and today I am going to be reading an excerpt from Sacred Economics, Money, Gift, and Society in the Age of Transition. As many crazy things are happening as that ambulance demonstrates, this is a remarkable book by Charles Eisenstein, one of the inspire, one of the most inspiring authors writing today, in my opinion. So I'm going to read a little clip from the introduction and walk through this beautiful ecosystem here in Pennsylvania. So please enjoy this excerpt from Sacred Economics. At this writing, all over the world, machines stand idle. Factories have ground to a halt. Construction equipment sits derelict in the yard. Parks and libraries are closing, and millions go hungry and homeless while housing units stand vacant and food rots in the warehouses. Yet all the human and material inputs to build the houses, distribute the food, and run the factories still exist. It is rather something immaterial, that animating spirit which has fled. What has fled is money. That is the only thing missing, so insubstantial, in the form of electrons in computers that it can hardly be said to exist at all. Yet so powerful that without it, human productivity grinds to a halt. On the individual level as well, we can see the demotivating effects of lack of money. Consider the stereotype of the unemployed man, nearly broke, slouched in front of the TV in his undershirt drinking a beer, hardly able to rise from his chair. Money, it seems, animates people as well as machines. We do not realize that our concept of the divine has attracted to it a god that fits that concept and given, given it sovereignty over the earth. By divorcing soul from flesh, spirit from matter, and God from nature, we have installed a ruling power that is soulless, alienating, ungodly, and unnatural. So when I speak of making money sacred, I am not invoking a supernatural agency to infuse sacredness into the inert, mundane objects of nature. I am rather reaching back to an earlier time, a time before the divorce of matter and spirit, when sacredness was endemic to all things. And what is the sacred? It has two aspects, uniqueness and relatedness. A sacred object or being is one that is special, unique, one of a kind. It is therefore infinitely precious. It is irreplaceable. It has no equivalent, and thus no finite value. For value can only be de determined by comparison. Money, like all kinds of measure, is a standard of comparison. Unique though it is, the sacred is nonetheless inseparable from all that went into making it, from its history, from the place it occupies in the matrix of all being. You might be thinking now that really all things and all relationships are sacred. That may be true, but though we may believe that intellectually, we don't always feel it. Some things feel sacred to us, and some do not. Those that do we call sacred, and their purpose is ultimately to remind us of the sacredness of all things. Today, we live in a world 
that has been shorn of its sacredness so that the very so that very few things indeed give us the feeling of living in a sacred world mass produced standardized commodities cookie cutter houses identical packages of food and anonymous relationships within institutional functionaries all deny the uniqueness of the world. The distant origins of our things, the anonymity of our relationships, and the lack of visible consequences in the production and disposal, disposal of our commodities all deny relatedness. Thus, we live without the direct experience of sacredness. Of course, of all things that d deny uniqueness and relatedness, money is the foremost. The very idea of a coin originated in the goal of standardization, so that each drachma, each stator, each shekel, and each yuan would be functionally identical. Moreover, as a universal and abstract medium of exchange, money is divorced from its origins, from its connections to matter. A dollar is the same dollar no matter who gave it to you. We would think someone childish to put a sum of money in the bank and withdraw it a month later only to complain, Hey, this isn't the same money I deposited. These bills are different. By default, then, a monetized life is a profane life, since money and the things it buys lack the properties of the sacred. What is the difference between a supermarket tomato and one grown in my neighbor's garden and given to me? What is different between a prefab house and one built with my own participation by someone who understands me and my life. The essential differences all arise from specific relationships that incorporate the uniqueness of the giver and the receiver. When life is full of such things made with care, connected by a web of stories and people and places we know, it is a rich, nourishing life. Today we live under a barrage of sameness and impersonality. Even customized products, if mass produced, offer only a few permutations of the same standard building blocks. This sameness deadens the soul and cheapens life. The, pre the presence of the sacred is like returning to a home that was always there and a truth that has always existed. It can happen when I observe an insect or a plant, hear a symphony of bird songs or frog calls, feel mud between my toes, gaze upon an object of an object beautifully made apprehend the impossibly coordinated complexity of a cell or ecosystem, witness a synchronicity or symbol in my life, watch happy children at play, or am touched by the work of genius. Extraordinary though these experiences are, they are in no sense separate from the rest of life. Indeed, their power comes from the glimpse they give of a realer world, a sacred world that underlies and interpenetrates our own. What is this home that was always there, this truth that has always existed? It is the truth of the unity or the connectedness of all things, and the feeling that is that of participating in something greater than oneself, yet which is also oneself. In ecology, this is the principle of interdependence, that all beings depend for their survival on the web of other beings.
that surrounds them ultimately extending out to encompass the entire planet the extinction of any species diminishes our own wholeness our own health our own selves something of our very being is lost if the sacred is the gateway to the underlying unity of all things it is equally a gateway to the uniqueness and specialness of each thing. A sacred object is one of a kind. It carries a unique essence that cannot be reduced to a set of generic qualities. That is why reductionist science seems to rob the world of its sacredness, since everything becomes one or another combination of a handful of generic building blocks. Here comes the sun. Stay tuned for part two of the introduction to sacred economics.